talking today about interpreting and applying Old Testament law to the New Testament believer. And our lecture will cover the basis of God's laws, the nature and purpose of Scripture, God's unchanging character, universal principles, specific applications, Exodus 21 to 23 as a test case, and what to do when you can't figure it out. Okay? So, uh, we'll begin with the basis of God's laws. God is the king of the universe by virtue of creation. Therefore, everyone who lives in the universe is subject to God's law and will be held accountable to their, for their obedience or disobedience to it, according to Romans 2, 12 to 15. God's laws do not just apply to Christians. Okay, as king, God's character and will are the basis of all his laws. Specifically, God's laws can be thought of as rooted in different pots. His divine character, his design in creation, which we could call his decretive will, his desire for our good, which we could call his desired will, and his accommodation of human <coughs> sinfulness. And we'll talk about each of those. Some of God's laws are rooted in his character. Requirements and prohibitions based on God's character are inherently moral. Okay? In any conceivable universe, it would always be wrong to be untruthful, unholy, or unloving because of who God is. It will always be right to be righteous, loving, and truthful. Okay? Given God as he is, Lying will, will always be wrong, properly understood. Telling truth will always be right, properly understood. Okay? So I'm calling these inherently moral, meaning that by their very nature they are moral. Okay? Some of God's laws are rooted in creation. When God created the world, he designed humans to function and relate in certain ways. His design established laws that we must obey. Such laws are not inherently moral. Their morality is rather a function of the Creator's will, and therefore obedience to them is an issue of morality, but the laws themselves are not inherently moral. So, for example, heterosexual reproduction in humans is not an inherently moral way of reproducing. God could have created us to be autosexual, where we were both male and female, and reproduce individually. God could have created uh, so that we are asexual, like certain plants that you stick down a shoot, goes across, pops up, out comes a plant. Okay, uh, And theoretically, he could have made... Uh, uh, homosexual relationships, and any of these are, theoretically could have been God's design, but because God designed it this way, that then gives it morality. Okay? Obedience is, and we find biblical appeals to creation as grounds for uh, moral appeals in Romans one twenty six, where he says that women leave uh, or men leave the natural use of the woman and burn in their lust one toward another, working among themselves that which is unseemly. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Timothy 2, these texts all appeal to creation for establishing some of God's laws. God's, some of God's laws are also rooted in his desire for our good. In his wisdom, he sovereignly chooses to require and prohibit certain things. Such requirements and prohibitions, again, are not inherently moral. God may permit something at one time, then later prohibit it without violating his nature. Or he may require something and make an exception to that requirement without violating his nature. 
So for example, clean and unclean animals, those two designations existed prior to the time of Noah. Moses did not create those categories. They were You were permitted to eat them from the time of Noah to the time of Moses. Israel was prohibited from the time of Moses to the time of Jesus to eat clean and unclean things. And since the time of Jesus, it's been permitted. So God's purpose in those permission and denial of permission involved his desire to do good to his people, although precisely what good is involved uh, may change from time to time. Then the fourth pot, so to speak, of God's, in which God's laws are rooted, is accommodation of human sinfulness. God gave Israel some laws that permitted them to do things he did not want them to do. Such permissive laws may be revoked by God at any time he chooses. So, for example, in Matthew 19, 8-9, Jesus told the Pharisees that God gave permission for Israelites to divorce their wives because of the hardness of their hearts. Okay, So that permission, inspired by God through Moses, had as its operative basis the sinfulness of the people whose sinfulness was being constrained by, not permitted, not God's like, well, these people are so bad, we're going to uh, let them do what they want to do anyway. No, no, that's complete misunderstanding. These people are so bad that they will abuse women and use them for financial gain as well as sexual pleasure, and so I'm going to limit their capacity to do wrong to other people by requiring that you cannot remarry a spouse after she has been married a second time, whether, her, whether she's divorced the second time or she, her husband dies. Why? Well, because then that would be using her for financial gain. You got the dowry the first time around, now she's been divorced again. Ah, more money. We can bring her back in and send her out. You know, bring in the money, send out the wife. Um, and secondly, there a second purpose explicitly stated in the text, the one I just stated is more inferential, is that God says that she has been defiled and that you defile the land when uh, a woman has multiple sexual partners, whether that involves prostitution or multiple marriages and coming back to a first partner. Okay. If you'd like more discussion on that, on the Aldersgate Forum website, I have a paper in which I discuss... Um, mistakes to avoid when discussing divorce and remarriage, and I deal with the issues associated with Deuteronomy 24, 1-4. I may or may not have time this semester to talk about that when we cover Deuteronomy. Now let's talk about the nature and purpose of Scripture. One of the primary purposes of Scripture is to reveal who God is to us. Both Hebrews 1 and John 1.18 make it clear that God's purpose is to, to uh, exegete, as John says, the Son has exegeted the Father, John 1.18. That's translated, exegeo is translated, explained him. Okay. According to the New Testament, the Old Testament was written to instruct and equip us. Everybody knows 2 Timothy 3.16 here, not everybody knows Romans 15.4. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So, this diagram illustrates the best way I know to relate the Old Testament law to the Old Covenant, the New Covenant, and what 1 Corinthians calls the law of Christ. In the United States, we have a constitution which is the basis of federal law. All 50 states 
are subject to the Constitution and uh, do not need to reproduce in their own state statutes federal laws, though they may reproduce those statutes if they choose. So in Florida, uh, it is a state law that murder is illegal. Okay. In Florida, the speed limit is 60 miles an hour on the interstate. In Texas, it is a state law that you don't murder, and the state speed limit on the interstate is 70 miles an hour. Okay. So, Florida state law contains both federal law and specific state-related laws. Murder is illegal in Texas, not because Florida state law is binding on Texans, but because murder is against federal law. Federal law is reflected in both Florida and Texas state law. Okay? So when I leave the state of Florida and enter the state of Texas, a Florida highway patrolman cannot stop me on the Texas interstate and find me for traveling 70 miles an hour. Right? Because their laws don't apply once I'm in the state of Texas. In the same way, God's eternal law, which is summed up in loving God and loving neighbor, transcends all covenants that he establishes with anybody at any time and is applicable to all persons in all covenants at any time. It's like the Constitution. And under the Mosaic Covenant, there was both eternal law and specific time-bound cultural law, which of course reflected the eternal law and principle in that covenant. Lying is wrong under the new covenant, not because the Mosaic law or covenant itself is still binding, but because lying is against God's eternal law. Eternal law is reflected in both the Mosaic law and the law of Christ. So, There's two things that this diagram does not make clear that I want to make sure you are able to distinguish. You need to distinguish covenant from law. Very few people seem to have a clear understanding of the distinction between them. Okay. A covenant is an agreement between two or more parties. The, the covenant has no relationship to people who are not parties to the agreement. The covenant may contain laws. Those laws may be binding upon the covenant members as well as binding upon non-covenant members because the laws themselves derive their authority not from the covenant but from the lawmaker. Correct. Correct. So I can say the Mosaic Covenant has no binding authority on me as a believer, as a covenant. I'm not a member of that covenant. I've never been a member, won't ever be a member. But that does not mean that the laws in the covenant itself are irrelevant to me because some of the, all of those laws are based on the authority of God with whom I'm in relationship under a different covenant, admittedly, but nonetheless, he as king, his laws have relation to me, I'm making sense. Any questions? Well, the covenant is essentially, I will be your God and you will be my people. And you will obey the things that I tell you to do. And we will live in this relationship. Now, the language of the Mosaic covenant is the exact language that God offers us in the new covenant. I will be your God and you will be my people. But it's based on a different sacrifice, a different priesthood, a different 
uh, promise, different set of promises. Uh, promise, different set of promises. All the things that Hebrews says are better. Okay. So, uh, this slide just basically says the same thing with both of those, so we'll move on. So God's revelation of himself to us has three key aspects. It's a revelation of his unchanging character and will, revelation of universal principles that reflect his character and will, and revelation of specific applications of universal principles. Okay, So let's talk about God's unchanging character. I'm not going to belabor the point, but Malachi 3.6 and Hebrews 3.18 support the claim that God's character never, never changes. We learn about his changing character from direct statements and from indirect evidence. Direct statements include things such as, I, the Lord your God, am holy. So we now know something about his character. Indirect evidence comes from biblical narratives. For example, we see God being patient with his people. We learn God is patient. Biblical laws are also indirect evidence of God's character. As we identify the universal principles which underlie them and which then reflect his character. A universal principle is a principle that is true in all times, places, and cultures, from which are derived specific applications. Universal principles are rooted in God's unchanging character. So, be holy for I am holy, God's character is holy, therefore we must be holy because he is holy. That's a universal principle. Universal principles will have many different specific applications. So the application of be holy is in 1 Thessalonians 4.3, don't fornicate. In Romans 12.2, don't be conformed to the world. In Leviticus 19, don't curse a deaf man. Don't put a stumbling block in front of a blind man. Don't steal from the poor. Okay? The Bible gives us enough examples of universal principles applied to specific situations to teach us how to apply its universal situations principles in situations it does not cover. So let's talk about specific applications. Specific application is an application of a universal principle to specific people or groups for specific times for specific purposes. So when you do your paper on the Sabbath, you're going to be identifying in that data what are universal principles. What are the specific applications? The definition I want you to use for these terms I'm giving you here in this presentation. Okay? I think it would be a nice touch to also identify what the universal principles teach us about the unchanging character of God. How is God's character reflected in the universal Sabbath principles that he gives? Okay, specific applications may have universal application, or they may not. You can tell whether a law is a specific application or a universal principle by asking if a more specific or more concrete application can be made from the law. If not, then it's a specific application. Okay. Now, I think that this system could be uh, ramified in ways that make it more complicated. So we could talk about levels of specific applications and levels of universal principles, and, but I, I think that complication it doesn't necessarily help the system or communicate the idea more clearly. Although I do identify these two specific types of specific applications. Generic applications given to a specific group of people, they appear in the form of do X all the time of never do or never do X. Thou shalt not murder is a specific application. Okay. 
uh, it reflects a universal principle of love your neighbor as yourself, which reflects the character of God who loves. And then there are special specific applications, like kill all the Amalekites in Canaan. Okay. And that, or in the New Testament, bring the parchments when you come. Okay, specific command, specific application. And maybe a better one might be, for example, um, don't go to the temple of an idol to eat meat there if Christians will see you. And, you know, that related specifically to cities where there were such temples. Yes? Um, the first one you had there about stuff shall not murder, um, for our paper, a lot of it is, a lot of the verses that are given um, are specific applications. They are given to a person, given to the Israelites <coughs> at a specific time. Um, but I've not gone through and said this is a specific application. I've gone through and said this is a principle of rest. Yeah, it is a specific application to them. But it, I see it more as a universal principle um, because if, if it's the case of uh, specific application, then the entire Bible would be a specific application. Okay. It's true that all of Scripture is given to a specific audience at a specific time. And if that's the criteria, then all everything's specific. That's not the criteria. Okay. Um, applying the question I asked in the previous slide, can you make don't murder any more specific? My answer is no. <coughs> A more generalized statement would be don't take the life of people. Okay. Or life is sacred, treat it appropriately. Okay. That would be a universal principle. Don't murder is a specific application of that principle. So in your Sabbath material, uh, you must rest is a universal principle. Applications of that include you, your manservant, your maidservant, your ox, your ass, blah, 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 um, are not to work. Okay, does that make sense? So if you if you can think of a way to make something more specific, then you can call it a universal principle. If you can't think of a way to make it more specific, then you call it a specific application. So if we, in our paper, if we say the specific application, we don't have to say this is, this is a specific application to these people for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. We can say it is a specific yes. Under the universal Correct. Correct. Okay, so here's the diagram that reflects what, how I envision this working. Out of the unchanging character of God flow universal principles from which flow specific applications. Okay. This model provides us a mean for properly interpreting and applying scripture to our circumstances. Here at GBS, we almost always introduce this model in the context of Old Testament, New Testament relationships, but this is not limited to Old Testament, New Testament relationships. It is a hermeneutical model for understanding all of Scripture. Okay? When we come to any passage of Scripture, we ask, is this revealing God's unchanging character? Is it a universal principle? Is it a specific application? If we conclude a law is teaching a universal principle, then we ask, what does this reflect about God and what specific applications can be inferred from the principle? Okay. So, if we're at the level of be holy, which is a universal principle, then we go up to the character of God and down to specific applications. And it's crucial to go up first because God's character becomes the uh, guide for determining the applications. Okay. What is true about God 
will must then come through in the way in which the principle is applied. If we decide a law is a specific application, then we ask, what's the universal principle behind it? What does this teach about God? And what other specific applications can be made from this universal principle? So the three-step process here is we move from a statement, for example, um, if a man steals an ox and slaughters it or sells it, he owes five oxen in restitution, a 500% restitution rate. That's clearly a specific application. What are the universal principles behind it? Well, the principle of private property, owner, ownership's clearly there. Principle of um, just rest, retribution, so that when when an ox is slaughtered or sold, it cannot be reclaimed by its owner. That makes the crime more grievous than if it was just found in the possession of the th thief, and therefore the restitution level is higher. So what does this teach me about God? Well, God uh, says that he has rights as the owners, owner of his property, okay, and that uh, therefore, that right is devolves upon us as people made in his image. And coming back down to specific applications, I say, okay, I, I see that there's a di difference between the restitution rate for oxen, for sheep, and for petty theft. Petty theft rate is 120%. Sheep rate's 400%. Oxen's 500%. Steal a man's ox, you've stolen his chief means of livelihood. He can't plow his field. Okay. So, the application then, in a society where we don't have oxen as a means of livelihood, would be you steal a guy's tools out of his carpentry van, you steal his van and all of his tools, you've essentially stripped him of his way of doing livelihood. That kind of theft should have greater restitution penalties than somebody who lifts a wallet on the sidewalk. Making sense. Okay. When, it, when it comes to specific applications, uh, if you need to step out, please feel free. Is there anything uh, in the immediate context, the nature of the genre, or in the rest of Scripture that keeps it from being applied to today? By immediate context, I mean, for example... When God told Saul to kill all the Amalekites, that was given to Saul. It wasn't given to David. It wasn't given to Samuel. It was given to Saul. So that eliminates its direct application to me. The nature of the genre. Uh, um, just for example, descriptions and narratives are not prescriptions. So just because something is described as happening doesn't mean that I have to reproduce that. I don't have to reproduce the marriage practices that we find described in Scripture. Okay. Uh, the rest of Scripture, there may be New Testament uh, adjustments that impinge upon the way in which something would be applied from the Old Testament. Okay. Now, we're going to shift at this point from my PowerPoints to looking at the Book of the Covenant in Exodus 21 to 23. And I want to uh, talk about how to apply uh, this material. In the first six verses of Exodus 21, we find the case when you buy a Hebrew servant. And clearly we've got specific application 
going on with the purchase of a slave. He serves for six years. In the seventh year, he goes out free without paying anything. Okay? If he came in by himself, he goes out by himself. If he had a wife when he came in, then his wife... If he came in by himself, he goes out by himself. If he had a wife when he came in, then his wife will go out with him. And I want to stop there. How would a Hebrew become a slave since all Hebrews began as free persons? Uh, the only way that uh, the Old Testament explains this is failure to pay debt. Debt incurred either through crime and required restitution or debt incurred through borrowing and inability to repay borrowed money. Yes? But what you're doing is you're... Well, it may not be that the person to whom the debt is owed will want to acquire the person as their servant. Okay. And so they then become available for purchase to the general community as an indentured slave. Yeah. So that's the conditions upon which this can happen. In the seventh year, he goes out free. So God limits the term, limits the amount of time a person can be indentured, okay? and says that when he goes out, his service has been his payment. Okay? And... He doesn't. He does not have to purchase his freedom. In other words, freedom is his as a divine gift by God. It's not a commercial commodity. Okay. God, therefore, makes all men free, and men may cause themselves to be in servitude by their poor financial management or crime. But freedom itself, the gift of God. Now, I think this is worthy of theological reflection. What does this teach us about the unchanging character of God? Um, well, let's just work with the freedom piece there. He can go out free. I take it then that freedom is something that God values. And he values for us as his image. I take it that he values it because he's good and freedom then is good. Good for us. Okay. Though it may not be the best good if you've been criminal or negligent. All right. Um, but, but the part of this verse passage that bothers us in the West is if his master gave him a wife and she bore sons or daughters, the wife or children will belong to the master and he will go out by himself. Okay, because in our mind, once you're married, that relationship supersedes any other relationships. So I want to illustrate here why I think the Net Bible is a worthy tool that you should regularly make use of in your study of Scripture. You may not be able to read this, so I'll read it for you. The slave would not have the right while enslaved or the means to acquire a wife. How could he pay for a wife since all of his earnings are going to his master to repay his debt? Thus, the idea of a master giving him a wife is clear. The master would have to pay the bride price to the wife's parents, and make the provision for the wife. In other words, not only is this guy not able to buy a wife, he can't even support them. And so the master is providing the provision, the, the price, supporting them while uh, own, in possession of the, the person. And uh, so in this way, the wife and children are actually the possession of the master unless the slave were to pay the bride price. But he is a slave because he got into the debt. The law assumes that the master was better able to provide for this woman than the freed slave. Here's a guy who, now he's free, but what means does he have of supporting a wife, supporting children? He's likely to get right back into debt and 
go back into indentured servanthood. And so this is actually care for the wife and children. It doesn't mean that he couldn't buy them eventually back, purchase them from the master, but it's actually providing for their well-being better than if he were to take them with him. I would think so, yes. All Hebrew children are going to be free. Um, marriage is a little different because of the bride price contractual obligations. Um, and I'm, I would assume that the servant would have made a deal with his master, you provide me a wife, when I'm free I will work so long, kind of maybe like Joseph or Jacob, I'll work so much longer and uh, repay the money that you have. I'm sure the intention was eventually to do that. But the law provides a case that if uh, he decides, you know, this guy treats me better than I can treat myself whenever I'm working. Uh, I can't even create this standard of living for myself, so I'm going to stay here, at which point his servitude becomes permanent. Okay. Which tells me then that permanent servitude is not inherently immoral. Okay. It can be chosen legitimately. And that it's not necessarily contrary to the character of God. Okay. And it's and even indentured servitude for uh, crime is not uh, demeaning or dehumanizing, since God proscribes the, prescribes this for for the appropriate method of punishment of these crimes. Okay, Making sense? Yes. Um, I, I may have read this completely wrong my entire life, but um, to me, these verses say as well that. If a master wants to up his slave count, and he can take one of his female slaves, basically say, I want more people working for me. Here's a husband, here's a wife, have kids, uh, your seven years are up, okay, see you later. The kids stay with him, the wife stays with him, and then Um, okay, that's a good question. I, I suppose it could have been used that way, but my understanding is that you could not own Hebrews permanently un unless they freely chose that. So there would come a point in, in society at whatever, basically it's 20. 20 is the age of military service in Israel, uh, ancient Israel. Uh, so at that point, I would assume that those children would have the right to be freed, could choose to be indentured, permanently indentured. It's unlikely that they would. And while their mother may be owned by the, the man um, because of the purchase of the bride price purchase, uh, it's unlikely that the husband, if he chooses to go free, would, would allow her to remain in that position long. Right. So, um, what I see the law doing is limiting the use of another person's labor for one's own profit and ensuring the potential for personal freedom while allowing a person to have the choice to live at a better rate under servitude than when free. So I think there are enough boundaries in place that that wouldn't – just because they, the female slave you own had kids doesn't mean the kids no longer have a right to be free. I mean, the master purchased the woman and the wife for his servant. Is she, at that point, owned in the terms of slavery, or is she owned in the terms of that metal wife that 
Well, she's owned in the sense that she, her husband is in debt to the master for the bride price. So he contracted... No, no. But... Um, This, you also have to keep in mind that this uh, that God envisions the primary that slaves primarily come from non-Hebrew ethnicities because the Israelites were allowed to make permanent slaves of Canaanites, not the seven nations but others, but they couldn't make permanent slaves of Hebrews which then suggests that God was giving special treatment to Israel that he did not require of Israel in relation to other ethnicities. Um, which, which you can look at two ways. One way to look at it is to say, well, this is an accommodation of human sinfulness. Since God <clears throat> knows that slaves will be had, uh, the minute I try to walk down that road, it seems like a, a non-answer to me. Uh, I don't exactly see how it curbs human sinfulness at all. It may curb it in relation to his people, but not in relation to others. And since I, my understanding of the character of God is that all men are equally bearers of his image, and that Israel's ethnic blessing was conferred freely upon it by God and was not merited by Israel... Therefore, my assumption is, when I look at the capacity to own people permanently, that this is not somehow contrary to the character of God, or uh, maybe maybe you could it could be argued that the only context in which, or at least the initial context in which non-Israelites would be owned permanently would be because they were captives of war. See, God has Israel scrub Canaan clean. Everybody's gone. And it's when Israel encounters other groups who want to fight against her that then these per people who are fighting God's people, who are captured in war, then become permanent, can become permanent slaves. Uh, the law explicitly prohibits kidnapping, so it would be it's wrong for Israel to send raiding parties out to other ethnic groups and capture people for the purpose of slavery. Yeah, I, right. Unless you have permanent ownership of a set of slaves, you've got more expense out of them than you're getting benefit back over the long haul. Well, I was, I was just looking more at the, the um, going, going to, to 18 or 20, as I said, I, I was figuring 18 or 20, so add another two years onto the estimate. 12 years old, it's probably whenever they can actually maybe start doing manual labor um, and being able to be so, yeah, you, you, so, I mean, you get eight years. You get eight years, you spent 12. So, yeah, that's right. That's an economic question that a master would have to make a choice about. <laughs> 
Okay, now, if, if that verse is challenging, the next one is even more challenging. If a man sells his daughter as a female servant, she will not go out as male servants do. Okay? Now, uh, this paragraph is troubling to modern readers, but given the way that marriages were contracted and the people lived in the ancient world, it was a good provision for people who might want to find a better life for their daughter. Okay, the word ama refers to a female servant who would eventually become a concubine or a wife. The sale price included the amount for the service. That's really crucial there. Sale price included the amount for the anticipated service benefit as well as the bride price. So she's 20. You've likely got 40 years worth of service. So what is 40 years worth of service going to be worth? Uh, that's going to be a hefty price. Okay. Plus the bride price. Okay. The arrangement recognized her honor as an Israelite woman, one who could be a wife, even though she entered the household in service. The marriage was not automatic, as the conditions show, but her treatment was a safeguard come what may. So the law was a way then for a poor man to provide a better life for his daughter. Okay. So if she does not please her master who has designated her for himself, then he must let her be redeemed. He has no right to sell her. See, that's, there's a limitation on ownership. Your ownership doesn't give you the right to sell uh, a female Hebrew slave because he has dealt deceitfully with her. In other words, the original purchase was with the implication that I'm going to marry this person. She'll become part of the family. I do not want to marry her now. You we're not living up to your contractual word, so she has to be redeemed. If he designated her for his son, then he will deal with her according to the customary rights of daughters. Okay, let me just uh quickly uh grab the what to do when you don't know what to do slides. Um, I will upload this screencast, if that's what you mean. I'll do it just this moment right now. Well, my... Uh, sorry, I'm out of time. <laughs> I can't find that slide, so uh, maybe we can look at that more. I will 